We come now to a session that is really a big fun. Uh, we have a, new, a number of known faces. We're talking about scaling up the heat pump market. What can we do? What can we do a little bit also from the perspective of what can we do as industry? And I'd like to welcome to the stage as our moderator, uh, Johan Carlson. He's a scientific, uh, scientific officer in the Joint Research Centers in Patton probably one of the best safeguarded peace places to work uh, that I have known, uh, that I know, and uh, I, I leave you the introduction to the rest of your panel. Yes. Looking very much forward to it. Thank you very much. Uh, do you hear me? Yes. Yeah? Okay. Okay, so this session is about um, um, scaling up the heat pump market, all uh, hands on the deck. And uh, as you know, there are many policies now supporting heat pumps. And lately we have the Repower EU with the target to add 30 million heat pumps until 2030. Uh, however, there are some uh, challenges and uh, maybe some barriers that we need to overcome. And we will discuss that in this session. So here um, I will first introduce, you can come to the, and have a seat here, and then <laughs> we will do the introduction a bit differently. Yes, so first we have uh, Lena Weinert, she's from the Rheinfeld um, uh, region in uh, Germany. Can you make a short introduction of yourself? Yes, yes uh, thank you. Um, yeah, my name is Lena Weinert, I'm an advisor for sustainability, climate, mobility, and digitalization at uh, VDW Rheinland-Westfalen. We are an uh, association based in Düsseldorf and we are representing um, 480 socially oriented uh, housing companies and uh, collaborations. Um, yeah, and um, simply in, uh, in North Rhine-Westphalia we have uh, 1.1 million uh, residential units. That, um, uh, that our members have. And um, one of the main, or probably the main problem that we are currently working on is how uh, can we manage heat transition and keep housing affordable at the same time? Yes. And then we have uh, Patrick Crombert from Dyke in Europe. Yep. Uh, good afternoon, thank you. Uh, so yeah, I'm Patrick Crombe, I'm head of the heating SBU uh, in Dyke in Europe. Uh, we are a manufacturer of, uh, of heat pumps, uh, both air-to-air -air heat pumps, air-to-water heat pumps, I found the, the, the full scale. Um, and basically I'm, I'm very interested to, to have this discussion here. Scaling up, I think, is a, is a main thing uh, to make sure that we keep the industry in Europe. Uh, and that's definitely our policy and also our commitment to make sure that we can produce these things in Europe and then install them in Europe. Yes. And then we have Philippe Ravisler from uh, Thermomondo. Can you introduce yourself? Yeah, hello. Good afternoon. Um, I'm the founder and CEO of Thermomondo. We launched that company a bit more than 10 years ago. Um, more than 40,000 customers, installations, and launched our heating as a service product in 2016. Uh, you know, a key product uh, when it comes to affordability and simplicity for customers, especially when it comes to heat pumps. We added a PV business and a battery business at the beginning of the year and um, um, look at ourselves as a, as a strong contributor when it comes really to scaling because, you know, Patrick will be able to share that there is uh, probably enough hardware now in the market. The question really is how do you get to that next efficiency level in the installation and financing process? Yes. And then we have uh, Martin from Aira. Yeah, I'm a CEO of ERA. Uh, we are a relatively new player in this space. We are backed by Vargas Holding, the impact build that launched Northvolt and H2 Green Steel, other impact companies. And ERA's mission is that we want to really accelerate the electrification of residential heating and make sure that we can provide clean energy tech solutions to consumers for an affordable monthly fee. And that would save them money. CO2, and they will really drive the energy transition. We are a direct-to-consumer company, but we base it with a very high degree of vertical integration, going from designing our own products, manufacturing them, selling, installing, and providing consumer financing. Yes, and uh, we have Bertrand from Schneider Electric. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. Good afternoon. So, uh, Bertrand Dupré, I'm in charge of government affairs for Schneider Electric. So, Schneider is one of the world leaders in uh, energy management and industrial automation. So, we don't 
make heat pump, but it's super important for us because we do everything that kind of integrates the heat pump, either in buildings, industry, or in the different places where it should uh, be deployed. Uh, like you say, I mean, electrification is key for us, uh, residential, industry, everywhere. So we have huge expectation about, you know, like the heat pump actually driving the market forward in Europe. So very glad to be uh, joining this discussion today. Yes. Okay. So welcome to all of you again. Um, so first, uh, I wanted to ask all of you about the main challenges and barriers that you see to scaling up the heat pump market. Um, Maybe, Philippe, would you like to start? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I think we met uh, uh, here on Brussels last year. Uh, it was very much about, you know, the availability of hardware. So um, investment into manufacturing capacity. And uh, I think to a very large degree that has been ticked off. Uh, it might not be completely ticked off for the next 10, 15 years, but if you look at the development of the past 12 months, um, we just look at much more capacity and probably slightly over capacity already. Um, uh, now, if you look at policy making that same, same uh, time period, then um, I think it's clear that you know, it hasn't really tackled what, uh, or delivered what consumers are looking for. You know, consumers, and personally, as an, as an entrepreneur, I don't really care so much about subsidies. You know, I don't like to ask for subsidies, but what I do ask for is clarity. And, uh, and if you take Germany as an example, you know, there is just no clarity, or it hasn't been enough clarity. And that clearly is the reason that you know, if you take the German heat pump market, uh, it is at a fifth of the size of what it was from an order book level a year ago when we met uh, the last time. So clarity is the number one. Um, the second is really simplicity. You know, and heating as a, um, as a service comes in here. Uh, um, it's also on a permitting level, you know. Um, I, I spend one day a month with my sales agents. Uh, I did so yesterday, and uh, you really look at permitting on a local level, right? It's distance routes to the neighbors. They might differ on, on a county level in Germany, actually. So there's a lot of complexity, and I think companies like us um, really take all that complexity away and make it simple for, for, for homeowners. And, and thirdly, it's really affordability, right? So, um, uh, and I think that was probably the biggest mistake that the German government did when it launched um, the, 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 the law that now has been passed. Um, it is really that people in a society which is in a recession, and most of Europe is not doing too well, um, and you have high inflation at the same time, then of course people are worried. Uh, and, and, um, and, and you need to address that in the very first moment you, you talk about policy making and about change. Because, and that's the, my last comment, let's all understand that, you know, uh, the heat transition is really a consumer transition in its core, right? You cannot decarbonize heat by reaching out and convincing millions of homeowners. And that is very different to, let's say, renewable energy production at utility scale, right? This is really, equally to, to the mobility and transition, really about consumers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much. I think we will go a bit deeper into all of those uh, areas later. Mm -hmm. Uh, Patrick, would you like to...? Yeah, I would like to add to that. Indeed, I would agree that the, the industry has, has, has basically taken the measures quite seriously from, from, from last year onwards. Uh, unfortunately, now it's, there's, there's a bit of a, of a backlash, as you mentioned as well. I think we see that across the countries, uh, which to some extent is not a surprise. I mean, you always have these ups and downs, uh, and it's not always pleasant, but, but it happens and we need to deal with that. That's, that's what the industries are doing. I would also like to agree that we cannot continue to depend on subsidies. I mean, uh, an industry cannot depend on subsidies, and it's also not fair, I think, for society to do that. Maybe on the not affordable part of the market, you need to, you need to have, call it then, more social corrections, but I wouldn't call that a subsidy. That's really more social corrections to make sure that everybody can come on board at one stage. So I would still call for that, but mainly it's, and it was highlighted before in one of the previous sessions, it's about running cost, and the moment, the moment we can make the running cost at least on par or more affordable towards the electric solution, I think that's when things will, will really start to happen. That's when the user will see that, okay, this makes sense. Uh, and we all know that if you look at the penetration rates of heat pumps in one country or another, and we compare that next to the price between gas and electricity, there's a clear there's a clear correlation. There's no doubt about that. So for me, that's the number one to address. Um, mm -hmm. And I think all the rest will follow from there. The other colleagues will, will address that as well. The simplicity of insulation is there. But as long as we cannot deal with this, uh, this running cost issue, it will always be a, a very steep hill to fight. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, from the regional perspective, uh, how is it there? Yeah, um, I think I can agree with uh, especially what uh, with what uh, Philip said. Um, I just want to add that 
it's not only the homeowners, but it's also, of course, the tenants that are um, um, uh, affected by, uh, by heat transition. And um, I think um, uh, housing companies, they, they know this. They, they don't need to be um, made aware of the problem. But um, what, what we are talking about is affordability, especially. And um, when, when we look at what is currently happening at, uh, the, in, in Germany and also on EU level with regard to uh, legislation, with regard to uh, regulation, um, uh, the EPBB, B, EPBD, for example, that's currently discussed here on uh, EU level, it will affect us in a way that um, we're talking about 210 to 260 billion euros per year that will have to be paid for a heat transition um, if it um, is passed the way the EU Parliament is currently uh, thinking of passing it. Um, and so, um, the, the question is who, who is supposed to pay for this because we cannot make the, the tenants pay for this. They, they simply cannot afford it, but the, the, the housing companies can't afford it either. And so this is really the problem that we have to find solutions for, and of course subsidies is one way, but uh, I think we also have to reduce the costs. Uh, of course, um, for, for um, heat pumps on, on one way, but also for the follow-up costs, for example, for electricity. Um, and also we have to find uh, regulations that are long-term, as, as you already said. We were talking about 2045 uh, carbon neutral building uh, uh, housing stock. Now we're talking about 2033, where we have to have um, modernized 45% of um, our buildings in Germany. And that's simply uh, not possible. We have to really work with long-term goals. Thank you. It's very interesting. So, Martin, how mm -hmm. do you see uh, at this as a startup company? I can just echo what has been said so far. And if I take a consumer lens, I mean, it's high up from cost. It's not uh, a good thing for a transition. I think the low customer awareness, it's something <coughs> that we in the industry, uh, together with uh, policymakers, politicians, have to work on. And there's a lot of myths. I am myself coming from Sweden, and you know, having a heat pump, it's the norm. If you go into a Swedish house and you meet a friend who has not a heat pump, you, you ask yourself, why? Why? Mm -hmm. And uh, it's the opposite in Europe. And uh, spending quite a lot of time in the UK where we operate, and uh, I, I think there's a lot of unfair myths uh, being spread in the market, the uh, which is absolutely you know, uh, unfair to, uh, to the heat pump. I think. We have had artificially low gas prices uh, for a long time. Introducing uh, uh, price caps on gas and electricity, which cement the, the spark spread in a negative way, it does not help consumer economics. And we are very positive. I think that's partly why we do this end-to-end -end customer journey. We need to make sure that we can create affordability in this. Because in the end of the day, it lands on if there is a consumer economic in this or not. And we're absolutely certain this is the case going forward. Yeah, and um, what yeah, do you I say, mean, Bertrand? Yeah. No, thanks. I mean, just to add maybe um, things that echo but bring us uh, um, a bit uh, of other colors to the picture, I would say the first is uh, upskilling, which is an obvious story. I mean, you know, I have a personal experience and I think many of us in the room have uh, to challenge, you know, like uh, people when you, are, when you have to renovate a building and you want to install a heat pump, um, you know, that happens to me last year in Brussels and I have asked three different uh, heating services company and uh, all of them told me, you know, impossible to install a heat pump because the climate is too cold here, which we know it's wrong, right? So upskilling, I think it's a, it's a very important issue. Then a second issue, which is... Um, the, um, also linked to who we are as Schneider is a go-to-market strategy in the sense that the heat pump challenge is a bit the kind of, especially for building renovation, is what uh, the same challenge as for energy efficiency broadly speaking is that it's in fact more impactful if you could bring different pieces of the decarbonization puzzle to the end user. So it's heat pump, storage, 
BMS rights and, and to bring also, also financial solutions that guarantee you know, a return on investment for them. But it's difficult, right? Because the value chain is very fragmented. And so this, there is something here to develop which is linked to regulation, but also to the, let's say, to the business because it's a relatively new business. And then the third aspect is what my colleagues say, it's about the legacy thinking, right? So, I mean, just look at what happened during the energy crisis. 700 billion euros have been spent by the EU overall just to subsidize energy prices and by new sources of gas, right? So, I mean, we are talking about the lack of, of financial support, but if we would have directed a bit of this money toward more electrification or, or heat pump, I think that would have helped uh, uh, a more sustainability future. Mm -hmm. uh, several of you mentioned that uh, the cost needs to come down and we need to find a way to include the, uh, the people that cannot afford to buy a heat pump. Uh, do you have some, can you elaborate a bit more on that, uh, Martin? Yeah, I, going back to what I said before, uh, I mean this whole energy transition, the most exciting thing with it is it will actually save consumers money. Mm -hmm. I think we have to realize that. And it's not only heat pumps working in isolation, it's also combining this with other uh, energy tech solutions, energy storage, solar, and EV. I think in the first panel we talked about the ability to, you know, uh, with the keynote speaker, flex services, you know, the importance of balancing the grid in the future. There's a lot of things being able to do. And adding a heat pump, for example, to an existing solar installation really unlocks the full potential of a solar installation. You double your self-consumption. So I think there are great opportunities to make this affordable in the first place. And number two, I think we need to remove uh, the burden of the upfront costs. I think 40, uh, households will, uh, they will probably invest 40 to 50,000 euros in the next 10 years in this type of solutions. And if we want to make this available for the broader masses, we really need to provide affordable financing to consumers. And I also think that we, as an industry, we have a great opportunity here to really take out cost. With increasing scale, and we, I think we are all convinced that this is a growing industry. And with that increasing scale, in every single step of the value chain, we will be able to take out cost. The more experience, the more specialization we have in this industry. So I think that will make this affordable and available to, uh, to the much broader audience than it has been today. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned that uh, we need to take uh, away the initial cost for at least some uh, groups in the society. W would that be l with a um, favor favorable loan or with grants or what do you think? Yeah. I think subsidies and grants, it, it, it's important in every industry to, to get traction started. But I think long term, it's unsustainable for society, if I want to be controversial. I think we, we have, in our sector, make this work for the consumers. And I'm sure we can do that. And uh, when it comes to consumer financing, I rarely see such a great interest from uh, other sectors, including the, the banking community, you know, they all understand that consumers, will, they will spend. Good customers who already have a mortgage, you know, well-paying customers, and they will add 50,000 euro on top of that. And it's low-risk customers because they pay every single month for the house and they will not leave it. And uh, I will, I'm sure we will see very favorable mortgage extensions from the retail banks coming out in the market in the very near future. Yeah, Philip. yeah, so there's a lot of innovation happening around financing, right? So it's um, um, our financing right now is, is um, asset-backed, right? Um, but uh, quite likely the market is going to switch over to revenue-backed uh, or based financing. Um, um, like Martin said, you know, if you take one of our SPVs, it'll be uh, typically like 2,000 German homeowners, right? So that's your risk profile. And as a bank, all you need to know is to understand, you know, it's, you know, even if <coughs> some of them default, and it's in part of our math, you know, that's a pretty, pretty nice risk to have. So you can actually get to very good, good risk return profiles. Um, I think you need to be also very good, uh, certainly for the next years, to be able to incorporate available subsidies into your financing products, right? Because you cannot compete with that cost of capital and you also don't want to. 
Um, so it'll be always a blended product, and, and you know, so some cash flow is coming from the subsidies, others is coming from, you know, that financing from um, from banks. Mm -hmm. Uh, you mentioned also that uh, costs have to come down earlier. Uh, is, do you see that also when it comes to the heat pumps, that they have to Absolutely. Down? Yeah. Absolutely. First of all, I mean, um, uh, oversupply is going to help, right? <laughs> he doesn't like that, but it, uh, it, uh, they, they just all did a fantastic job over the past 12, 18 months, and there's a lot of manufacturing capacity in Europe now. So that is going to help. Um, um, our contribution is, and you know, roughly the cost of labor is kind of like similar to the current cost of a heat pump. If you look at the overall cost of a project, and the third element of the cost base is the, it's the other hardware, so pumps, uh, water tanks, and so on. And so, the, the two items that we really work on is really how much of that work that needs to be performed is being performed at the point of construction can be done uh, so previously via, for instance, pre-manufacturing. So yep. what are the pre-manufacturing steps we can take that partners can take for us that we've got to take ourselves uh, and thus, you know, industrialize more and more and more of the um, overall project. And secondly, um, and, we, we, and that's actually public data, we issued a white paper on that or published a white paper on that. So we looked at the heat pump installations. Actually, we split into 34 activity bundles, right? And, and the question really is, um, um, which activity bundle has to be done by whom? Right? So, again, how much can be done you know, in, in pre-manufacturing, um, how much should be done by a certified electrician, uh, how much by a certified plumber, and what can be done by a trained person you know, that gives opportunities to, to people that um, migrate to Europe, that um, come from different trades. You know, in this country like Germany, where you have certainly a decreasing number of industrial jobs uh, going forward, um, there's a vested interest of society to really retrain people from industrial jobs into, uh, you know, uh, installation jobs in, in, in that consumer-driven energy transition. Patrick? Yeah, I would like to add to that. Huh? I think, and, and it's a fact, I mean, scale in industry will, will, will contribute to cost downs. There, there's no other way. Uh, and that, that's also no, to some extent to be expected, uh, since investments are depreciated. But an important part as well, I think, is uh, the, the, the value chain, as you mentioned, it will also undergo a change. I mean, the heating industry typically uh, with the boilers was a, an extremely scattered uh, population and, and, and very much handicraft, and there's nothing wrong with that. But the fact of indeed trying to industrialize, trying to standardize, facilitate installations, speed up the installations, maybe concentration as well in different types of business models will, from my point of view, con definitely contribute to that. Um, and I know we, we, we joked a bit about the UK market before, but if there's one thing that the UK has shown is that that concentration can lead to, to, to economies of scale. Uh, the UK market is the, the biggest installer British gas is installing about a fifth of, of, of the units. It just happens to be, coincidentally or not, the cheapest boiler market in Europe. Um, so maybe there are lessons to learn, and I think new business models will definitely contribute uh, to that, and, and the market for sure will look tremendously different within, within the next five to ten years as, as what it has been done over the, last, uh, over the last 20 years. So all in all, I think that will contribute to, to making sure that we can overcome this hurdle, and for some customers it will be more important as for others. I mean, some will be able to auto-finance, as you correctly put it, uh, because the value of the properties is increasing, so that there are ways to, to, uh, to get financing for that. Others will not, and then new business models will come in. I'm also sure utility companies will play a role in that uh, to, uh, to make that happen. So I can only think that, that the market composition itself will drastically change. Yeah. Uh, what do you think are the biggest concerns that home owners have that, that are considering to buy a heat pump? <laughs> well, I can or why are they hesitating? <laughs> it's, it's affordability. We do the same 19 questions every three months to a panel of 1,000 German homeowners, and it's always affordability. People intuitively understand total cost of ownership. They don't use that term. They call it differently. Um, but it's really about bringing all the costs down that we mentioned. And, and one I want to add is really clarity about the CO2 price, right? So uh, we tell our um, customers, you know, there's clarity um, from now until 2026 in Germany, and then ETS is going to take over. Um, but it's just too soft for people to, to get that, you know. In the end, they have to almost do a risk analysis themselves, you know, where is the CO2 price going to go? And then at the same time, for instance, the German government is sending the signal that they paused the CO2 price increase this year. So you do get, as a homeowner, conflicting signals, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and that's why that goes back to the first one. It's about clarity. Yeah. Really, you need clarity as a homeowner to take your, in Germany, 20-year decision, right? You, you, you expect your system to work for 20 years. 
Um, yeah, um, I can add to that, uh, not uh, from a homeowner perspective, of course, but from uh, the uh, housing industry uh, or housing companies' perspective. Um, the costs, of course, being the, the, the biggest problem that, you, that we currently have, um, we also had some other aspects that add to a certain reservation or hesitation towards heat pumps is um, we had several cases where um, housing companies installed heat pumps and then afterwards were told by the network companies or network operators <coughs> that they could not connect the heat pumps to the net due to fear of network failure. And of course, this, if, if this information spreads uh, between other uh, housing companies and they talk a lot, um, this this leads to hesitation and, and, and a reservation towards uh, heat uh, pumps because, of course, they cannot be sure if they invest in heat pumps, will these heat pumps later work or will, be, will they be connected uh, to the net? And so um, this is also something that we have to work on. First of all, we have to have the information beforehand. So if it doesn't work, we have to know, can we use other options? And then we also have to update our nets. Um, I don't know if it's all around Europe, but in Germany, definitely, we have to update our uh, electricity nets. Mm -hmm. No, just to, I mean, just to add one thing, which I've been saying already, but it's I, I think it's back to my example about uh, this very uh, uh, Brussels experience is that uh, the lack of indicator, right? So typically, when you you have you want to do something in your buildings or in your house, right? You refer first to a EPC to an Energy Performance Certificate. And then you ask for advice, but what people will tell you to do first is ventilation, is, you know, like insulation of the roof while you live in the first floor, but never heat pump, right? So I think this is really also something that needs to be addressed, is how you bring, you know, like real uh, and consistent indicator for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, you men mentioned, um, uh, Lena, that there are some misconceptions sometimes is that also at a wider scale, for example, that some people might think that their house is too old and it's not possible to install a heat pump? Yeah. Philip, yeah, see absolutely. you are nodding. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so there's so many myths around it, <laughs> and uh, that's why we published a press release the other day, really with data of our uh, of two and a half thousand of our installations, right, and and some of our research data. And I give you the facts. You know, um, most Germans would believe, and probably most people would believe, you know, that you need a, a floor heating for a heat pump. Only 13% of our customers do have a floor heating. Most people believe that your home needs to be rather uh, um, built rather recently. You know what? Guess what? Um, our customers have the exact same distribution, like you know, the building stock in in, in, in German society. And then most people think you need um, to swap out radiators. It's only 16% of our constructions that we swap out radiators. So it's, it's just not true, right? And, and the question is, why is it so, and probably the same applies to the UK, why is there so much stickiness in, that, uh, in, in those news? And I think it's very simple. You know, we are um, in rather old continent, rather old people, um, and uh, vested interest of, you know, get, think, maybe imagine you're the owner of the, of the gas grid. Mm. Right, um, a, a 200 billion euro asset in Germany. You do have a vested interest to tell those stories. Mm -hmm. yeah. Martin? I just want to comment. It's okay also that not every household is heat pump ready Absolutely. today. I mean, that goes with any single technology out there. But a majority are heat pump ready today. And the question is, are 30 million heat pump ready? In, in the European Union? And the answer is yes, yes. clearly yes. yes. So we have enough to do for the next seven agree. years. And also, yeah. When you get time with a consumer today and say, do you think it's a good idea to install a new gas boiler that will be installed for at least the next 15 years? You know, this consumer economics, when you get the chance to talk with people, I think most consumers, they sign up on, it's probably not a good idea, whatever will happen with the gas price. Another thing, depending on country, but I think it goes in all countries, what we have been forced to do is we provide a comfort guarantee to all customers because there is a misunderstanding or a lack of trust. Will this work without underfloor heating? So we, we are very confident which houses we can serve and not serve. And it's really up to us. And I think that comes with this direct-to-consumer approach. We have to be much more confident and provide trust in what we provide consumers. 
Yeah, I would like to pick up on the story of, of Bertrand, actually. Yeah, I think it's also down to education. And, and we mentioned already the industry has scaled up last year on, 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 on manufacturing, but we also and are scaling up on training. And, and training of, uh, training of the, the first installer that goes to the site is, is the most critical one, because he's the one that will say, it won't work. And, and today, that's exactly what they are saying. Uh, and not because they don't want to, but really because they are concerned. They are honestly concerned that this customer in the middle of the winter on a Saturday afternoon will go back to say, it doesn't work. And then he has to go to site. And, and this is something I think as an industry we still have to address. One, as an industry, but also down on, on, on education level. Personally, I cannot understand why in the, in the technical educations on, 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 on schools, they're still teaching boilers. They are still teaching boilers. And then afterwards, we have to train them on heat pumps. I mean, if we start from there, gradually, I think at least we will solve the issue. In the meantime, we have to do our work and do the after training, but let's at least also start at the bottom. In, in all fairness, though, the world is changing there. Um, um, I'm a member of the German Heat Pump Summit at, uh, hosted by, by mm -hmm. Robert Habeck. And, uh, you know, the very conservative association of plumbers and electricians, you know, it probably doesn't go get much more conservative, to be very honest. <laughs> in the past 12 months, they really have changed their mm -hmm. curriculum, right? And when we started in the first meeting, which was probably 18 months ago, uh, you know, in your three-year vocational education in Germany, there were eight hours of heat pump training okay. uh, for plumbers. Today, I don't know the exact number, but it's, it's much more. So, so they are actually changing, and, and, and probably much faster than what I thought a year and a half ago. Yeah, the, <clears throat> the retraining of um, installers is often coming up as a concern that maybe we will not make it by 2030 unless we do something now to, to do the retraining. Um, what do you think there? Are you quite sure that it will uh, work out to retrain um, installers to also install uh, heat pumps? Um, yeah, because indeed if you then do notice that the capacity is built up, people are people are coming. We don't have to drag people to come in. Mm. Uh, so the, there is, if, if the market is there, the, these people, they are getting the question from the customers. They, they, they want to give an answer and if they can't, they do somewhere feel they need to get informed. And, and we do see that. I mean, I think other manufacturers down in the, in the room will also uh, confirm that. I mean, the, 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 the training that is being offered is really being attended. So th that's not the problem. Uh, but we do need to make sure that once they are trained, there is a market there for them to address. Because if they come to a training and there's nothing for them to do for the next year, yeah, then th that's when they really start asking questions, am I losing my time? Uh, yeah. So that's a bit the situation now which we really we have to avoid. Uh, last question regarding costs and then we move on to policies. Um, it's about the synergies. You also mentioned that before, that you can install uh, heat pumps together with solar PV. You can use the flexibility of heat pumps. And um, yeah, how can we leverage this potential more, you think, to, to boost the deployment of heat mm. pumps? Bertrand? No, and, and first of all, it's a huge potential. I mean, you had a report by the CRE, which is a French energy regulator, I think it was two, two weeks ago, that what we have done, Schneider, with their, in partnership with them, and that show that uh, you have about 20% energy saving thanks to flexibility in tertiary buildings, right? Because, you know, the pattern of consumption is, is very much the same every day, and therefore you could really, like, um, uh, you know, address the curve uh, by uh, implementing very basic flexibility measure, such as, you know, like connecting the in pup to, um, to the grid, right? Um, but then it's going to be even more impactful should you connect the different pieces, right? To your pond storage, building management system, solar panel, EV, and, and heat pump. And actually, this is what we are trying to do. We have um, started a partnership with Green Yellow, which is an energy services company um, based in France, where we actually, you know, they bring the kind of financial engineering, plus, you know, like the services to end users, which are mainly tertiary buildings, retail, and, you know, kind of consumers. And we bring the technology, and not necessarily our technology, because we only produce BMS, the rest we bring from different partners. But I think, what is great, we think about this story, is that you, know, you bring a kind of the, the, a value creation, uh, which is a kind of toolkit to the end users, and which makes life much easier, right? So I think this is a kind of thing. 
again, at this stage, maybe more for the business player, but we see that as really a, 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 a great future for, for the future of this uh, of the microgrid, right? Because in the end of the day, we are talking about prosumers here. I personally don't think there's such a thing like a, like, the, like the heat pump market. There's a residential energy market. And, and so um, you've got to think uh, holistic uh, when it comes to the home. Um, and um, you've got to optimize, so there's levers of optimization per asset. So to run the heat pump more efficiently with a different algorithm than what you know, the factory default algorithm is, gives you 10, 15 percent. Uh, you know, to install a second meter and tap into a, a heat pump tariff or heating power tariff gives you four, five, six cents per kilowatt hour. Um, uh, but to then link it to PV gives you, you know, that increase of roughly 30 percent of your self-consumption. Um, so <coughs> the average household uh, consumes two and a half thousand kilowatt hours of, of, of power in Germany, pre-heat pump, pre-EV. Now you add the heat pump. That's anywhere between four to 6,000 kilowatt hours, depending how you run it. And now you add the EV, depending on your driving and charging assumptions, you add like typically like 2,000 kilowatt hours. Mm -hmm. So that home is currently changing from being a 2,500 kilowatt hour entity to 11, 12, 13, 14,000 kilowatt hour entity. And that's where the opportunity is. And I think players that really understand it this holistically and, and, produce, and create solutions that really are simple and that really address that overall house they, they'll be well placed. Okay, thank you. Let's move on to policy. <laughs> so we talked a quite a long time on this. So, um, what do we need from policymakers uh, across Europe to support the deployment of heat pumps? Yeah. Uh, Martin? Okay. I think we touched that Martin. clear and consistent, clear and consistent messages. I, I think that's yeah. a, a good starting point uh, if you want to change the minds of consumers. I mean, how many heat pumps do you buy in your house owner career? Maybe two. So it's a big decision, and you really want to make sure you make the right choice. So what we've seen in Germany in the spring, uh, what we recently learned in the UK, certainly does not help. The discussions we heard here regarding uh, hydrogen, I think that certainly does not help, especially if money, you know, state or, or government money is being put into various uh, research projects, diverting from, from, from the right path. I think we need a level playing field. Uh, the, uh, the price of gas, as I said before, is artificially low. Take the UK there. The, the environmental tax on electricity is actually higher than the gas price itself. It does not foster any change of minds. Uh, I, I really think uh, we need to have that level uh, playing crazy. field uh, organized. And when you introduce these price caps, which now is the case in, in, in Europe, in many countries, mm -hmm. I mean, you, you, you set an artificial uh, spark spread between uh, gas and, and electricity prices. So I think that that is really blocking the right development. And uh, I think that is really needed in order to create awareness among consumers. So I think that's two important points. Patrick, yeah, do you want very to much so. I think that that, yeah. that really is the point. It's the clarity, mm -hmm. and that was said in previous uh, mm -hmm. panels as well. It's clarity, stability. You can you can link that, and the price cap between mm -hmm. uh, gas and uh, gas and gas and electricity. Mm -hmm. That that's really the key two points uh, to to address on top. I think there's a lot of good work that has been done on regulation. Let's also say that. I mean, there's a lot of good work that has been done, which is basically I think why we are sitting here already. Uh, the next step is really to just provide the stability, this clarity. Um, and then some measures on, on, on indeed how to balance uh, power to gas prices. Philip, do you want to add something? Not Sorry. much to add, actually. Um, uh, I, I think what uh, now very likely that German um, subsidy scheme will be looking like, it has a, had a, has a social element, and I think other countries should uh, look at that. You know, um, households with an income below 40,000 euros, they get more subsidies than those that are above, above 40,000 euros, and I think that does matter mm -hmm. a lot for social acceptance. Um, and simply for affordability, um, run the math. You live in very rural, in a rural area of the country. Uh, your house is actually not really appreciating in value because nobody's actually moving there. Um, um, you're a pensioner, um, and there are 23 million of those in Germany. Um, uh, and you know, very likely your income is below 40,000 euros. And then you are asked to buy something for 20, 30,000 euros. That's just it's not, not going to happen. And then, of course, people get afraid. Um, so I think other countries um, should. Play, uh, pay a close look at this, how this pans out on Germany. Mm. 
um, what should the regu regulatory framework look like to ramp up the heat pumps? Um, do you have some more suggestions how it the troll maybe? No, I, I think I mean I think there is a. <coughs> will keep being postponed, right? Mm. And at the same time, the building renovation framework uh, will not be changed dramatically. I mean, today, according to European law, when you renovate a building, you have to upgrade the envelope, but not the technical building system, neither the heat pump, right? So I think, and, and many funding quality of the envelope, which is great, right? Which is good. But then I think that the regulatory framework has not really um, uh, integrated the need to kind of support the heat pump and all the technology which are associated to it. Um, and I spoke about the performance certificate, which is another example of that. One, one issue which may sound a bit trivial, but which is important, is about how to make sure that we really deploy to the market smart heat pump, right? So heat, heat pump which can um, interconnect with the energy system. And that means having um, a flex-ready kind of heat pump, right? Mm -hmm. Which, you know, could send the data and that could be used to, to, to kind of be integrated into a demand side or flexibility program. That is very important because in the current energy market design reform, there may be the possibility really to um, deploy more demand response program, also at, you know, uh, sub-element levels, so, you know, like heat pump or EV. But then if the devices cannot really, uh, you know, provide data, then you cannot do it simply, right? So. Yeah. I've got one more, actually. Um, I mean, we had it earlier, uh, uh, you know, that move from CAPEX to OPEX, right? It'll be so um, important, you know, call it rental models, call it as a service models. And I, I do see that policymakers have not really understood that yet. Um, it is very simple for a hardware manufacturer to get, you know, a loan from the European Investment Bank. It's basically impossible to get the same similar loan for a player like us, right? Because they love to subsidize CAPEX, they love to help, help, uh, uh, help um, um, uh, investments. And I think if you, you know, are working at a development bank, you should ask yourself, what's the true gap that we have, you know, on the way to 30 million heat pumps? And quite likely, it is equally what we are doing versus what, what a manufacturer does, right? And, and so really don't underestimate the, uh, uh, let's say, need for financing and the need to tap into, you know, a cheap source of capital that you directly forward then to, to your consumers. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now we talked about what is needed on the policy side. Uh, are there also new business part partnerships needed uh, to leverage the deployment, Bertrand? Well, I, I, I already mentioned that, uh, and I think you, I mean, you made the point that, you know, there is a, actually, I, I was reading the figure about uh, um, the, the, the amount of sustainability investment uh, originated from Europe, and it's huge, right? We have a capacity to invest in sustainability, which is huge in Europe. It's about 75% of the investment fund sustainable are from Europe. So long story short, I think it's, how we bring closer you know, those financial players into the game. Um, I spoke about this partnership with UNESCO. I think that is a moment that should be further Yes, so um, I think we have covered most of our, our questions here, and we wanted to uh, open it up for the audience also. If you have any comments or questions to the panel, do you have any immediate reactions, uh, for example, on what... Yeah, Thomas. Voila, yeah, uh, it works. So I have a question actually to, uh, to Lena and uh, potentially to Philip and Martin, because Lena said, who should pay for this? And that is, that is, I think this is a driving argument of the confusion that has led the German discussion. All the people that said, pretended or not, we don't have money, they, they came up with the conclusion that nobody wants to pay for it, so it can't be done. Now we have 
two of you in this room that say very actively we have other solutions that actually can be more financeable and maybe more palatable also to poorer households. Do the two of you talk to each other to provide solutions for the social housing sector, maybe for individual people with poorer households, um, to make it more commensurable, the change, the transition? Thank you. Um, I don't think that we personally talk uh, to each other, but um, of course there's, um, um, there's um, a talk between the different associations, between the different sectors. Um, not from me, because we, we have a head organization that's based in Berlin, and due to the fact that uh, energy, energy politics in Germany is, is um, uh, um, based in, in Berlin and not on the federal level as we, as, in, as uh, the, the uh, regional association are. But there are talks, of course, um, we also have there's also a talk with, with companies that provide solutions for um, managing heat transition, and we also have corporations and things like this. So, uh, of course, we, we are actively working on finding solutions. Um, I, so, maybe we should talk uh, also um, with, with you, but, um, yeah, there is. So, let's look at the different sources of capital, right? So. Um, uh, in any capital that, that is invested into us as a, as a let's, let's just call it the development company, you know, that, let's call it growth capital, clean tech growth capital, there's so much available. You know, I, I'd love to start the company again. Unfortunately, I started 10 years ago. Valuations are very different today than when I started. And, and there's so much capital available. So there's no issue there, right? Because a lot of people have understood that this is a huge business opportunity. Mm -hmm. the second one is um, then really the asset-backed financing bank driven, you know, of course, cost of capital has increased. Um, that is then, you know, impacting consumer prices. Um, um, but there's generally enough capital there. So it's really a scale game. You can at one point start securitization, green bonds. You know, we want to do a green bond but rather soon. You know, there's enough capital available. Like I said, the European Investment Bank would not give us any capital. They would give it to, to him if he builds mm -hmm. a factory, but not <laughs> to me to scale that business, right? Um, now, the third one is really, how do you, um, and that addresses your question, how do you find the, the unbankables, right? Because no German commercial bank gives me a loan for any homeowner, because that's the ultimate risk, you know, we are fully transparent on every single project we do, uh, if he, she is 70 years older. Mm. Because, you know, if it's a 15-year loan, there is an inevitable risk. Right? Yeah. So we are in direct talks to policymakers and to KFW and, and, and to address that risk. And partially it has been addressed now. It goes back to do policymakers really think it through all the way or don't, shouldn't they be talking to us even more frequently to really build that product, right? Um, so it, it is for the social and needy and simply for, for the pensioners, you know, mm -hmm. they are not bankable. And as a private company, we, we can take that risk or finance it with a more expensive source of capital. I cannot do asset financing with my growth capital because my cost of capital is too high. Mm -hmm. so, so there is certainly a, a, a role to play for development banks and thus for policymakers here. Okay, there's one more question down there. A very interesting debate. Is this working? Yeah? Okay, good. Um, I was wondering if you could elaborate a bit more on the role of connectivity. I mean, I see there's different... Uh, Daniel Agostini from the Anna Group, so we're a large uh, utility uh, taking on the opportunity. Uh, the role of connectivity in deployment. Um, do we have an issue? What progress has the recent work that the Commission has done in the digital world? Uh, has it solved the, some of the challenges that we're facing in connecting heat pumps to other devices at the house, you know, at the home level? Um, you know, wh where do you see this area uh, in making a difference in actually scaling up the heat pump market? Can we do more? <laughs> Can I start? Go ahead. Go ahead first. Uh, I think uh, that's uh, spot on a topic, being newcomers in this sector. Uh, we are spending a tremendous amount uh, on our tech development and are laser focused on connectivity and building in the intelligence or smartness. Back to what you said, you know, demand response services, it's going to be very important in the future. 
And I, I think this whole industry, we need to embrace much more on the digital capabilities you find in other industries. And being the newcomers, I think we struggled a little bit to, uh, to find the type of uh, uh, hardware or, or partnerships where we really could adapt it mm. for what we think is, is needed to build the future ecosystem in the homes, where you can connect you know, energy storage in, in, in batteries, the PV, the, the charger, etc. So I think uh, it's important, and that's why we actually felt forced to move into that field on our own. And I think we as a group, we should spend much more effort in that area together. Yeah. I'd just like to add on that, I think from, from our point of view as a, as a manufacturer, producer, developer, I think the, if, if we would be left to our own, the next generation heat pumps would all and basically only be about smart and connectivity. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, regulations are forcing us also still to do other things, uh, which, which maybe are not contributing that much for the time being without going in detail. But definitely the next steps on, 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 on heat pump development should be about connectivity, ecosystem approach, uh, smart use, interaction with the grid. Because that way the, the heat pump can actually become a, an, an active participant of the grid instead of where historically a boiler was just consuming energy. Uh, this can become a node uh, of, of, a, of, a, of a bi-directional system, which I think also the grid operators want to, want to see happen, but this will still take resources to develop, and we need, indeed, uh, the, the resources to do that. Yeah, I think, um, first of all, it's ultimately our role to crack that, right? So um, we looked at the entire European home energy management system market, and, and basically all companies, not all, but basically all companies have entered, or their, their metal starting point was the PV system and the battery, right? And Many companies are pretty good in optimizing that. Very few, if any, companies are good in optimizing the heat pump, right? And the manufacturers are also not as good as they think they are because they often lack then the connection to the other assets because they look at it purely from a heat pump point of view. Um, so there's innovation to be done, and we have a very similar conclusion. You know, it probably has to be done by companies like us. Um, um, and, and that's why we, you know, we're, we're working on launching our proprietary HEM solution probably next year. But it does, it does, there is some complexity involved, right? And it's not, we're not as far as an ecosystem as we could be. And that is partially because many, maybe not all manufacturers, have until recently decided not to open up their, their APIs. And that kind of makes sense, but you can't do that with a company like us, which you know, has an equity story and a certain bargaining power. And I think it does need company like us to really break that up because it makes no sense. Because if I may say so, it is our customer, we are serving that customer, and I need to know exactly what my piece of hardware that I might actually be owning if it's a rental product is doing, how it's behaving, and how I can save money for my customers. And I can only do that if manufacturers open up the APIs. They're starting to do that now, but it did need quite a lot of conversation on that. Thank you very much. I think time is up. I want to thank the panel uh, a lot. I think the discussions were very interesting and fruitful. So thank you very much for coming and uh, contributing. Thank you. 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 Thank you.